Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's webinar, uh, an introduction to intellectual property, uh, and welcome to, to Startup Day. Um, I hope you've had an amazing day. Um, I hope you've been able to, to make the most of all the, the different talks and, and topics we've got uh, covered for today. So you've joined us this afternoon now, our last session uh, for this particular breakout room, uh, and it's called Introduction to Intellectual Property. My name is Jeremy O'Hare. I'm one of the uh, information experts here uh, in intellectual property. And I'm very pleased to, to put you through or take you through this, this hour. Uh, it's going to be quite a fast hour of, of lots of content uh, uh, provided for you. Uh, so really, it's a beginner's guide to everything you could ever want to know about intellectual property. But uh, at least uh, from my point of view, I would hope you get something um, useful and that the information I present today is, is going to be practical so that you, you walk away from the webinar uh, knowing what you need to know about IP uh, and how you can take it forward as well. So just a little quick note, um, we won't have time for any questions uh, during the session. However, um, you will notice that there is a chat function, I believe, on your screen. So if you want to ask any questions, I know there's a team of staff uh, in the background who hopefully will be able to answer your, your queries as and when. So there's the Q&A box there. So let's, uh, let's get started because time is short and there's a lot for me to talk about. And I have to say, this is an absolutely fascinating area. I've, you know, I've been involved with intellectual property now for a few years and I work at the center, the business and IP center. And I work with many inventors and, and start up and growing businesses over the time as well. And IP is just something that comes up a lot. Uh, and it's actually really important that we, we look at it and we get it right at an early stage, particularly if you're, if you're starting out because if you get IP right early on and you make the right decisions early on, it's going to make a big difference for you further down the line when you when you grow your business as well. So quick disclaimer, uh, this is not formal legal advice. Uh, we always say this, I'm uh, not a qualified solicitor on IP, uh, although I've worked with many IP attorneys, I understand the legal implications of things, but this is not formal legal advice. Uh, where it's relevant during the presentation, I'm going to just tell you when I think it would be appropriate to, to seek professional advice and, and what that might entail for you as well. Uh, another thing about getting legal advice, uh, it's pretty standard practice across the industry that you, you're able to get a free half hour consultation. Uh, and if you contact any one of these organizations, SIPA, SIPMA, Charter Institute of Patent Agents, China Institute of uh, Trademark Attorneys, or a local partner of ours here at the British Library here in Islington, uh, BRIFA, uh, B-R-I-F-F-A. They're um, also uh, a firm that, that works with small businesses providing IP advice, and you'll be able to get a, a half hour consultation with it uh, for free as well. So what is it uh, when I talk about intellectual property? What is it that we're actually about today? Uh, and I just want to just break it down to its simplest bare bones explanation and IP essentially is for protection for creativity and innovation. That's essentially what it is at its most basic. And uh, I'd like us to see intellectual property as a as a broad term and its umbrella term that's going to cover a lot of different types and expressions of protection. And we're going to go through each of those today. There's a whole kind of family of IP that we're going to explore um, together. Um, more on that in a moment. Uh, there's two sides to intellectual property. Uh, one side is that with the existing legislation, the law that we have, it, it rewards creativity and innovation. So uh, the legal framework is there so that you can uh, make the most of your creations uh, and, and commercially uh, make money from them as well. That is at, at its simplest. That's, that's one side of the coin. The other is the IP is there to uh, protect others from taking your ideas and innovations, at least without your permission and you having some say-so and, and even some financial uh, reward for that. Two halves, creates, protects your work and uh, prevents others potentially from uh, taking your work without your permission. Two sides of the same coin. The other thing about intellectual property that I think is, is really important for us to kind of get our heads around and um, as I go through this afternoon, this concept is going to make a lot more sense to you, I hope. And that is, we can view intellectual property as property. So uh, I like to compare it to actually owning physical property in the sense, you know, you, 
you might buy a house, if you buy some land, you even build a house potentially, uh, if you're lucky enough. Uh, but if you buy a house, uh, you have rights over that property. You um, can live in it, it'll acquire hopefully in value over time. Uh, you can give your property away if you so wish. You can uh, pass it on to your, your kids if you want. Uh, you can rent your property out. Uh, and it's rather like the same with intellectual property. You've got all these options with it. You can hold on to it. You can hopefully it'll grow in value as the business grows. Uh, you can assign it, you can give it away um, and you can rent it out. And in the world of IP, we call it licensing. So there's a lot of analogies between real house property and intellectual property. Now, the thing about intellectual property is that, and this is the first question that everybody asks, is that we all kind of start off with having an idea in our head. You know, that's often the first point. I've got this idea for a business, for a, an invention, for a creative piece of work, whatever that might be, it's an idea. And the first question we often get asked, and maybe that's the first question that you're asking right now and why you signed up today is, can I protect that idea? Well, the answer to that, the simple answer is no, you can't. That's trying to protect an idea in and of itself. So we can't protect ideas because how could we? An idea is just something that's in my head, it's in someone else's head. It's not until that idea becomes realized and that we can see it and expressed in some form, then we can start to look at intellectual property potentially covering and protecting your idea but it needs to be very specific and we're able to see what it is it's expressed in some way and that'll become more apparent as i as i go through the, the presentation so i mentioned at the beginning intellectual property is it's an umbrella term it's a heading that covers the whole family of different categories and essentially each of these categories of intellectual property protect a, a particular expression of an idea so let's look at this in detail. A patent is something very specific. It's a specific form of IP. It protects the way something works or the process of making it. It protects an invention, basically. A trademark is another form of intellectual property that protects words or logos that indicate origins of products or services. It's brands. It's the brands that we know, we see, we, we buy from every day. It's the household names that we know and the smaller names as well that we interact with and we may potentially do business with. That's a trademark. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Designs is a third form of IP and that's specific again. That covers the look and appearance of a product or object. So you can actually register for protection on how something looks and you can own that. Another form of IP, which perhaps many of you have heard of is, is copyright. And that protects a whole lot of different categories, which or subcategories, which we'll go into. But generally it's artistic or written works, paintings, books, films, music. If you're in the creative industries, I think there's a very high probability that something that you'll create will have a copyright involved in it potentially. And then lastly, there's a couple of forms of IP that aren't really talked about a lot, but I like to include them because I think they're useful and particularly as you're starting out, these might be very useful forms of protection for you to be aware of. And that's trade secrets and know-how, trade secrets and know-how. So we've got six uh, members of the family of intellectual property. And this afternoon, in this hour, counting down, <laughs> we've got a bit to go through. I'm gonna give you an introduction to each of these forms. So you can view this as, as a menu, if you like. You can see which of these expressions that you can protect and the best ways you can go about protecting them for your business. Now, three of these are uh, forms of IP that you can register. And you register your IP at a place called the Intellectual Property Office, the IPO. That's what I'll be referring to it from now on, the IPO, Intellectual Property Office. That's where you, it's a government department, you apply for protection for patents, trademarks and registered designs. Um, super important. I'll talk about them quite a bit as we go through. The other three forms of IP here are uh, non-registered rights and they are copyright, trade secrets and know-how. And we'll see why they're considered not registered. The basic answer to that is you don't have to go to the IPO to register them. As soon as you create, it's yours. But we'll look at how you can work that out in practice as we go through. 
I just want to land on another point here that, you know, because we're potentially starting a business and I think it's important to have IP uh, in your mind at this stage so that you can plan for um, putting aside a little bit of money where there might be the need for an application for a form of IP. Uh, potentially in the future, if you have to defend your IP as well, um, it's better just to be prepared for that eventuality and just put a little bit of money aside in terms of your, your running costs and, and the budget for the business. And in the same way that you put some money aside for marketing uh, and other forms of um, investment that you, you put into the business. And I hope for your IP uh, all going well with the business over time, uh, you would accumulate value in that asset that you're investing in. And then you, of course, at the end of t the time when you have your business, with your business, if you so choose, you can sell your business, you can sell your IP with it. And if you do this right in the early stage, as I said, it means selling the business, selling your IP as a part of that, or even separate to that, um, you'll be able to do it effectively and do it correctly. So went backwards in time there for a second. Ah, here we go. So here we are. <clears throat> here is a famous brand that we all know, perhaps love. This is, of course, the Coca-Cola company, and I, I use them to illustrate um, all of the six forms of IP that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So Coke have all the protection they could possibly have. And why wouldn't they? They're a multinational company that need it. So here on the bottom left, we have a Coke can. Um, that's not what's being protected. Something very specific. It's actually the ring pull opening of the can. Um, that can opener, or that ring pull opening on the can rather, uh, is, we did at one point have a patent on it. It was a new invention. And, you know, we, when we think of a can, we don't even think about the, the opening of it or the sealing of it. Um, but at some point in time, that was indeed a new invention. Uh, now, of course, it's all over the place. We don't think about it. But early on in the early days when that invention was first created, um, companies would have had to have paid the inventor a license to use that technology that was covered by a patent. So a patent is what's covered uh, in that little bit of innovation. So Coke would have had to pay a license to, to use that patent. A second here, there is a trademark. And of course, uh, you recognize the famous logo for Coca-Cola. That's been a trademark they've owned for well over 100 years. Um, very, very valuable piece of iconography there. And in many ways, it represents the whole company. It's the brand. Uh, and so the trademark, the registered trademark, is the legal ownership of that mark and indeed those specific letters, C-O-C-A-C-O-L-A, they own that run of letters, they own the imaging behind that as well. So um, very valuable piece of paper they own, um, and that's something they can do with that mark. They can license it out, merchandise from it, um, protect their reputation, all the things that are associated with the brand are therefore associated with the trademark. Here in the middle is uh, an example of registered design. Uh, and if we look at the, the shape of the bottle here, uh, you, you know, if you were to take away the logo Coca-Cola and just saw that shape of the bottle, I'm, you know, I, I would say that nine out of 10 people would recognize that as a bottle of Coke, obviously not from the logo, but the shape and design of it, we, we, we recognize that shape. It's, it's famous. It's in some ways iconic to the company and the brand. It, it speaks of, of, a, of a heritage. It's old, um, there's something timeless about it. And it's a very, very valuable design to own. Uh, and indeed the company owns that as a registered design. Um, a great design that is as well. It's stood the test of time. And here on the right, we have an example of uh, some copyright. And this is some old advertising marketing literature going back to the early 20th century. Um, the company owns rights to all of that collection. Uh, and that's very useful because they can um, reuse old material in, in advertising campaigns. If there's anniversaries, again, merchandising opportunities, they can merchandise fridge magnets, you name it. All of these things are property in the company, these images. It speaks again to the, to the classic appeal of the brand. So much they can do with that. It's their property. They own it. They can exploit it. They can commercialize in whatever they want. Very, very useful. So lastly down here, uh, we have a question mark, and perhaps you can guess what that question mark might re relate to. Uh, it's the trade secret, of course, and um, we all know what the trade secret is, and that's the, the so-called famous recipe for Coke. Apparently, uh, the recipe is under lock and key uh, in, um, in their headquarters in Atlanta. Um, only one or, or a few um, members of the team, executive team, have access to the combination lock on the safe. 
where the famous recipe is apparently kept. Uh, great bit of branding mystique behind that. Uh, it's the story that goes with the company uh, and also a great example of a trade secret. Uh, all I have to do is just keep it under wraps uh, because as we all know, no one knows the recipe of Coke, although it hasn't stopped plenty of people trying. And of course, whether they've done a successful job of imitating it, that's a matter of personal opinion. Trade secrets. Lastly, what's not on the screen here is know-how. Uh, and um, just to kind of really describe that, know-how is the, is the knowledge that's in the business acquired over the years. I think that has value for the business and, and knowledge that you, you, you certainly wouldn't want to give away to any competitors. And that might be things like um, demographic profiles of different countries, uh, sales information, um, how to launch successful campaigns in particular areas, marketing knowledge, a distribution knowledge, um, key commercial contracts, pricing, uh, the list could go on in terms of how a company runs and, and that knowledge that's, that sits within the company. And a big multinational famous brand people, the best people will be working for the company and they'll bring their experience and knowledge into the company and that'll, that'll build up the reservoir, if you like, of, of skills uh, and innovation that, that sit within the company. Um, very, very valuable thing indeed. Hard to put a price on, uh, but nonetheless, it's still um, valuable and we'd still count that potentially as intellectual property. So when I get to the know-how section, we'll go, we'll look at this from your point of view. What know-how do you have in, in your endeavors and how can you make the most of that? And where's the advantage that you can bring to that as well? So that's by way of preamble. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna just focus very intently on each of the six forms of IP. That's your general introduction. I'm not gonna dive into the, into the different members of the family. And uh, forgive me if it's going to be a little bit pacey and I have to, to go over things quite quickly. Time is limited um, and uh, I'll give you a little contact at the end of the session today so you can always get back to us and you can always put questions in the chat as well if you've got any queries or questions afterwards. But let's start right away with patents. So what is a patent? Um, a patent protects a new invention uh, and that's how something is works or how it's made. And there's a kind of a tick box criteria you've got to meet in order for something to be patentable. Okay, and it's uh, this is one of the more technical and tricky forms of IP, um, just to say that out, out in the front here. So there are some things you've got to, criteria you have to meet to get a patent, a new invention. It must be new. So in other words, this invention must never have been seen before, never been heard of, never been talked about, completely new, never been done. The invention must be non-obvious, that is, the invention has to be an innovative step on what's gone on previously to other inventions that might be similar to it. So it's, a, it's an innovative step, not obvious, really, really important point there. The invention must have, well, it should have a useful application, really. If you want to be commercial with your patent and to make your money back on the investment, you really do have to have something that's useful. Uh, and the patent should be better, cheaper, and different to what's gone on before. And this is just a word out, out for any inventors out there. And I, I encourage you to, to think along these lines. Uh, and I have a little mantra just to share with you, not mine, I didn't make it up, I wish I did, um, but it's a good one. And, and that is uh, to fall in love with the problem and not the solution. And, and I know when for inventors, and you, know, you come up with a new idea, the temptation is to think of a solution. Oh, I thought of this idea, it's gonna be great, it's gonna work for this reason. Maybe, I hope so. But I think it's better often to look around the world if you're if you're an engineer or an inventor of any, you know, if this is what you love doing and you've got a skill for this, uh, look at the problems in the world and then can you engineer a solution? And if you can, you can, it means your, your patent, your invention will potentially solve an existing problem. And if it's, a, if it's a big enough problem, there's a way better chance of your patent being commercial and the investment being viable. So that's my little tip on the side there uh, for inventors. Fall in love with the, the problem, not the solution. Uh, and if you could do that, then your patent, your invention will be better, should be better, cheaper or different uh, than anything else out there in the market. So that's a little bit of a, of a point there around what makes a good, a good patent. Because um, patents are, are very expensive investments to make and um, you have to be very sure that you're gonna get your return. I'll be talking about the kind of costs involved in, in a moment, um, but it's an important thing to get right early on, like all the forms of IP. 
Patent rights, another important thing to know about them, are territorial, meaning that you need to apply by different countries to get protection. And your first point of call, if you're in the UK, of course, you'll, you'd want to start potentially looking at the UK as your first market for where you can potentially uh, license your patent and turn it to something that can be manufactured, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and so uh, patents like property, other forms of property, they can be bought, sold or licensed. But here's the other thing about them. And again, it's worth thinking about this very carefully. They only last for 20 years. Patents only last for 20 years, meaning you can only commercialize for that period of time. After that, they essentially become public domain. Anybody uh, can use them. Uh, we think of these old patents like the zip, for example, uh, a long time ago now that was patented. There, there are zips everywhere. It's, it's, we don't even think about them as a, as a form of, uh, as a new invention. But you know, everybody's patent one day expire after 20 years, becomes public domain, anyone can use it. So you, your window of opportunity is small. By the way, the, the years vary on other industries. Pharmaceuticals are a little bit longer, 25 years. But 20 years for most people. So your window of time is short. And then if you're in an area of um, industry where it changes quite a lot and there are new innovations, your, your window of time may actually be even shorter in practice uh, to really commercialize. So that's a very important consideration. Look at the, the years and the timing uh, and make sure you can commercialize your invention quite quickly if you can. Now, um, there's an international dynamic here with territories. The thing with patents is you can apply for the UK, but if you're gonna trade or sell your patent or use it in other territories, you'd be advised to apply in those territories as well. Because if you don't, you don't get protection. And technically other people, other inventors in other countries can use patents that aren't protected in their countries. What, uh, in your country, what they can, can't do is import them back into your territory where you have protection. So in other words, think about where your patent is going to be commercially viable, where you're going to get a return on your investment and then look at applying in those various territories around the world where that's relevant. Um, costs, okay, here we go. Cost for a UK patent, if you do it yourself, do a DIY job, if you like, relatively inexpensive, I'd suggest it's 320. However, that's not the reality. Um, as I mentioned, patents are the most difficult form of IP, I would say, to, to get right. You need to write up an application with the claims of what that invention does. Uh, it needs to be written in a, in a very effective way, written in, in legalese, but also in a way that your patent can be defended against potential opposition, and it, you can maximize the claims uh, within reason, of course, that, that what that invention can actually do. So the, the, the wording and the technical specifications, everything at that early stage is actually really important to get right. So uh, most people, and this is where I flag up my first point around IP support, most people seek a patent attorney at the stage to help them um, get that, those claims right. And there's a statistic from the Intellectual Property Office whereby only one in 20 applicants that do it themselves get a successful patent um, uh, granted at the end of the process. It's a small number. But if you're an engineering background or you're familiar with the world of patents, sure, go for it, go do it yourself. But if you're rather new to this, then you really, it, it may be better advisable for you to get professional help. Um, so that's that's the um, the point there around patents. Um, the, the, the time process involved with getting a patent can be quite lengthy before it's granted. Uh, it can take two to three years, sometimes a bit longer. And as part of the deal of having that monopoly over the invention for 20 years, is that you need to publish the details of the patent, uh, thereby revealing the invention. Now, that's okay in this instance, because as soon as you file, you have protection. Um, uh, with, as soon as you get at the IPO, you have protection over that patent. Um, so when you publish it, when it's published, um, you've already got that protection. But nonetheless, you're revealing aspects of the invention that others can potentially use and improve on. Um, so there, there's a quid pro quo involved and there is some, some risks um, there as well. So another very, very important point about patents, I've mentioned the, the, the two so far or three about originality um, and the territorial rights around it. The other thing is that if you come up with a new invention, you have to keep it confidential. Don't divulge that with anybody um, because as soon as you share the details of your, of your invention, you potentially lose 
your rights to even claim a, a patent on it. Uh, so um, keep it secret if you have to divulge anybody with anybody, keep it to a minimum, but always use, would recommend non-disclosure agreements. Uh, I'm not saying the agreements are perfect, but it's better than nothing. You have some formal arrangement whereby you're, you're sharing information and confidence. And this URL on the Intellectual Property Office site, IPO, if you Google IPO spash, uh, space NDA, you've got a link there to um, some templates for NDAs, um, but if you want to fine tune that to your circumstances, again, um, uh, an IP attorney will be able to help you with that. Uh, be wary of invention promoters, people that can say they can take your invention and make you lots of money. It's very rarely the case, so just be aware there are people out there. There are some good ones, and there are a lot of ones that aren't good at all, and you don't get anything for your money quite often at the end of the process. So be wary, um, talk to independent people, professionals. IP attorneys will be fine. They're, they have a, a standard code of practice. Uh, just be aware that's that's a possibility to be, you need to be to keep an eye out on. The other thing about patents is, of course, if, if it's going to be a new invention never been done before, you want to prove to yourself that that really is the case. So uh, doing what we call a prior art search is an absolute must. You have to evidence that your new invention has never been done before. So you can do basic searches online in the industry. Um, you're applying this regarding where your invention is, is, is in, whether it's mechanical, automotive, engineering, or whatever else, whatever industry your patent's going to be in, know that industry well, look at the new technologies, do your research there. And also alongside that, um, do, uh, do a patent search as well um, for existing patents. And um, there's, a, there's a free database right there you can, you can use called a SPASNet. We've got about 120 million patents on there, going right back to the early 20th century for a lot of countries, sometimes a bit further back for others. Uh, certainly for the more recent patents, that they're all there. Um, very, very useful tool for you to search for existing patents. The British Library runs a separate webinar on patent searching. We don't have anywhere near the time for me to do this right now, but I'd recommend you sign up to that or speak to one of us um, after today. We can we can give you some guidance around uh, how to do a prior art search on, on a SPASNet and a few other options as well. But really important, getting that evidence that you can say this invention is absolutely new. So then when you file your your your, your patent, um, hopefully the examiner, the IPO will recognize that it is new and eventually um, grant your patent over time as well. So, wow, that's patents. That's the most technical and I would say heavier information, heavy um, section of, of the webinar today. Um, let's move on. Uh, there's still some more to go through. Uh, we get onto trademarks. This is quite quite fun. Um, many of us, I'm sure, will be looking at getting a trademark. Um, this is a lot, I think, more straightforward a form of protection. Uh, and again, part of the family of IP, this covers something quite different to inventions. It covers protection for names, logos, sometimes slogans, a shapes, even colors and sounds, but mostly it's, it's logos and names um, that trademarks are mostly used for. They are distinctive for the goods or services uh, which, you, which you have. Um, and very important principle here, they have to be distinctive and different from any of your competitors because you don't want to trade off on their reputation. You don't want to give a false impression. Uh, that's one of the fundamental principles that sit behind trademarks as there are others, but that's one. So we've got here on the screen, um, this is a great pub quiz question. Uh, what was the, the very first UK trademark? And the answer is staring at you at the face and, and on the face there on the screen. It is in fact the Bass trademark, uh, trademark number 00001. I think it goes back to about 1870 or around about the time that was first applied for. Hasn't changed a lot that the, the signature bass, the red triangle there, that trademark is still in use. Um, a different brewery owns it. They've had different brewers over the years that have bought and sold that trademark. Great bit of heritage there, still in use, which um, underlines the next point for me to make. Uh, trademarks can in theory last forever, unlike patents, which you know go out of date in 20 years. A trademark is renewed every 10 years and it is still active and in use. Um, it lasts forever, so it's a very valuable, potentially very valuable piece of IP to own if you build your business around your brand and you have the, the registered trademark for it. Exactly like patents, and you'll see a theme here. I, this particular form of IP is 
territorial, you register in countries or, or groups of territories. Uh, you can register uh, in European countries, UK, wherever, uh, wherever you want to trade. Um, like other forms of property, uh, it can be bought, sold or licensed. Uh, and the fees are, I think, a lot more straightforward uh, and a lot less expensive than the patent, of course. You can do it yourself, file a trademark for about 250 pounds. And then uh, there are a little bit extra fees that you pay if you want to register more classifications and, and so forth. IP attorney, you'd be looking around about 500 pounds or so plus to get their expert advice on, on the application um, and, and plus including the, the registration fee as well with the IPO. So it gives you some sense of, of pricing there. Now, a couple of important points around trademarks. Uh, it often comes up that people ask, can I have the same or similar name or mark as somebody else? And the answer to that is, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends literally on, uh, might there be any confusion um, in the minds of the consumer? That's the number one point. Uh, number two, um, we can look at that because um, trademarks are registered in categories, classifications, actually. There are over 40 of these classifications. Uh, if you want to I'll look this up after today. If you Google Nice classifications, Nice as in the, the city in France, the NICE, uh, you'll get a link to the 40 plus categories of trademarks. You can register your mark. And so the point here being, yes, you can have the same or similar trademark as someone else, so long as that you are in completely different trading categories, classifications, there's no, therefore there's no confusion. Here's the example here, Swan. Who could be confused between Swan car rentals, Swan matches, and Swan irons? Very, very different products, different brands, different companies. I expect that would own these trademarks, uh, therefore no confusion in the marketplace all as well. Um, where you need to be very careful is where there may be um, confusion in the existing classifications that you register for. So you need to do um, a trademark, I'll come back to this slide in a moment, you need to do a trademark search um, to make sure that your trademark is, is new, hasn't been done, not already in use, uh, as well as a general internet search to be on even safer side of things. And there's a link there to a trademark database. It's, it's a great database. You can search by uh, names and shapes and logos, and that'll help you to to find out whether or not your mark is original. But anyways, I'm jumping back and forwards for continuity's sake. Very important thing to do there. Now, um, there is a question perhaps you may have around registered and unregistered. What does that mean? So that you may have seen the, the letters TM uh, and you think, well, what does that mean? Uh, now the joke is it's totally meaningless uh, amongst IP solicitors and it's, it's well, not quite totally meaningless. It has some meaning, but it's not as strong as a registered mark. And let me explain. So with trademarks, you have in the UK, and I, I'm only talking about the UK, I think this works in the US as well, and, and I think Australasia, uh, you have a TM right, meaning, okay, you have a logo, you have a, you have a trademark, um, you can start trading with that today. So long as you've done your due diligence, there's no confusion with anybody else trading under the same name in your marketplace, you can in your marketplace you can start trading with that right away. If you have an unregistered right, you can put TM on on the name, and happy days. However, uh, that's not really helpful longer term. I would argue, uh, for example, if you get into any disputes, you you got a tough case with just having a TM. Uh, it's hard to, it's near impossible to assign your IP with a TM, to sell it with a TM. It's better to have that registered trademark. Uh, and that's when you file your, your application for your trademark with the Intellectual Property Office. Um, and if it's new and they recognize it, you'll get a registered mark. Uh, you can get the R in the, in the circle. Legally, you can trade with that and it's a, a valuable piece of paper to own. Of course, there are always exceptions. We have our friends at Google, TM, they don't need to register a trademark. They're big. Uh, everybody's heard of them. You, you can hardly imitate Google, right? Just by who they are and what they do. So they don't need to worry about registered trademarks. Other companies, McDonald's, who are very conscious of their brand and protecting it, um, of course they do, as do thousands and thousands of other large, small uh, enterprises. So FYI, here's some things to be aware of uh, when applying for trademarks. Uh, I'm going to start with the second paragraph. 
obvious things to avoid, anything causing offense, obscenity, blasphemy, uh, names of people of pictures of famous people, there's copyright implications there to begin with. International symbols and characters, no, generally, no. You won't get a trademark with those because they're already in use. And that's there's the confusion issue there straight away. Now, the very first point here, and this is where most people get tripped up on with um, trademarks, is that their trademark is too descriptive of the product or service. So let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> just to kind of tease that out. So uh, if I were to apply for a trademark and I make cakes uh, and I play, apply for the trademark Tasty Cakes, there's a very high chance I would say that the intellectual property officer will reject that application. Why? Because it's too descriptive, Tasty Cakes. Well, what's the problem with being descriptive, you might say. If we take it back a step, and think, well, what gives me the right to own that phrase? And I'm literally owning the phrase tasty cakes for my cakes, where my competitors, I'm sure, have tasty cakes. So A is too descriptive, and um, it, there's, a, there's a question of fairness there around even owning that, that phrase. So there's, there's a couple of red flags there right away. If, however, I make that phrase a little more distinctive, and I put, let's say, a name in front of it, Jerry's Tasty Cakes, oh, that's interesting. Suddenly, that mark becomes acquired distinctiveness. Uh, it's less descriptive. There's a, a better chance, therefore, of me getting that through um, on, on the trademark office and the IPO. So again, um, descriptiveness, something to be aware of uh, when you're, you're um, applying for a trademark. Likewise, you know, we have larger companies, Apple, famous example. They can apply in the classification for uh, software and for um, IT products, uh, retailing, whatever they can they can apply in those categories, but they could not get protection for Apple in the category dealing with fruit selling. <laughs> what would give any fruit seller the right to to have a trademark for Apple? It, it, it's just not fair. You can get the principle, and why would Apple even be bothered in the future of going into fruit selling? I ask you. But anyway, that that point aside, so um, that. I, th I hope explains the issues that you have to to, to jump over around um, distinctiveness for trademarks. I mentioned the, the search there already for trademarks. Um, just on this slide here, before I move on to the next form of IP and we wrap up on trademarks, just to make clear that you've got two options for your trademark. Um, you can file for um, what we call a word mark and an image mark. You can do and or or both and or both yes um, so here's an example bacardi they have uh, a trade name a trademark for the name b-a-c-a-r-d-i they have that formalized those letters they own those letters bacardi they also own the trademark on the logo the bat sign here um, they own both word Bacardi and image. So if your trademark has got a stronger visual element to it, you might want to just go for an image mark protection. Or if where there's a word in an image, boots would be another example. You've got the, the logo there, very famous, but also the, the, the letters boots, B-O-O-T-S. Um, just so that you know, you've got those options for your trademark. And of course, a very iconic trademark here, like the Superman brand. Uh, you, you don't need Superman, you just, you've just got the mark there, the image mark, and my gosh, um, that owning that mark is a, is a license to print money. You think of all the merchandising, uh, you, could, you, could, you could spin off owning that, that trademark. Anyways, that's a, that's a point aside. So explaining uh, the, the images and words you can go for uh, for applications for trademarks. You've got both options. Use either or both. So uh, two down, um, we get a little bit quicker as we go through. Take a breather, I hope you're all doing well. Um, moving on to registered designs. This one's fairly straightforward. I can, I can cover this quite quickly. Um, registered designs, as, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, covers the distinctive look or object of an item. Like other forms of IP, has to be new, has to be unique, no surprise there. Examples of registered designs, uh, you know, it could be an um, example here of, of wallpaper. Um, uh, any 
I would say any object um, that can be sold um, whereby the appearance has some value, uh, the appearance of it has a value. So, uh, you know, toys is another great example. Um, lots of registered designs are in the, in the toy industry. Uh, you, you can think, think of Shrek's. Uh, the, the, actually, interestingly, the, the Stormtrooper um, design of Star Wars, the helmet, that's a registered design. Uh, you, you name it, all of these different things um, it may well be designed. Uh, so the thing about that is, um, like you see the theme coming up here, registered by countries, um, it's property you can buy, sell a license, and you can imagine with, with toys, if you, you know, if you if you own the rights so on, if you're a movie producer and you own the rights um, on on the creations of on the set and the, and, the, and the characters and so forth, you can license out the registered design to toy manufacturers. That's that's a, that's a massive um, revenue generator. Anyway, uh, very useful piece of property. Um, they don't last forever, like patents. Um, they have a 25 year standard. Uh, you have some unregistered rights with, with designs as well. Um, uh, and you can see that there's um, a fairly inexpensive um, filing fee for that as well. And you can check to make sure your design really is new and original by looking on the design view database. Here is an example. And we also run um, separate webinars on doing design searches. So I'd, I'd really recommend you sign up for those. They're free um, if you, with the British Library, if you want to dig into this a little bit more. Now, you might think that uh, the fashion industry, there'd be a lot of design, registered design, uh, and actually th there's not. Um, the reason being, and if you're in, in the fashion industry and you're, th you're thinking about this, and I know a lot of people are, and many startups are looking to start up brands, um, a lot of people in the industry, they don't register their designs because the industry is very fast moving. Um, so one season will change to another season, um, and you know, there's constant inspiration of uh, uh, different collections and um, you know the fashion shows every year kind of define the look. There, there's all sorts of different, not copying but inspiration and 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 and, and interpretations of different designs. You can see what I mean. And uh, so a lot of people don't go for the design in that in that sector, unless you're creating a fashion piece that's going to stand the test of time. It's going to last a while. Uh, you know, the example here, a, a stiletto shoe where the, the design is so iconic. Um, Doc Martin boots, Ray-Ban glasses here is an example. Uh, anything which will have longe longevity to it as a, as a clothing or, or footwear design or jewelry for that matter, you, you may want to look at getting a registered design. And again, you, you do the drawings. Um, I don't have time to go into details of how you do that. Uh, but there's specifications you, you need to submit. Um, you need to do that properly. Uh, there's ways you can draw up the specifications to kind of give you a little more leverage and, and um, a little more flex with it. Uh, the specifications tend to be quite specific what they cover um, with the IPO. So you need to be aware that you're probably only going to get protection over that specific design and, and, and perhaps slight modifications to it. So Beware design really does cover the very specifics of the design. Uh, and all of these examples here are, are examples of different designs. Uh, perhaps famously here, the, the Stratocaster guitar, the, the head of that, the tuning head is, is a registered design because it's iconic and its look at the ITV mascot at one point was, was a registered design, you name it. So something just to consider if, if you're creating a new, a new object that you intend to sell, look at the, the design option particularly if it's got a, uh, some some longevity potentially to it as well. So um, moving now to copyright, moving out to our last 15 minutes, um, we spend a little bit more time on copyright for, for obvious reasons, because it again, it's one of the more involved forms of IP. I think perhaps many of you listening in today may be dealing with copyright. Um, so it's good to know what you need to know about this. Uh, it's it's fascinating area of IP. Um, so many different examples and cases and law and, and uh, uh, copyright issues always come up in the media, uh, particularly amongst musicians. Disputes amongst musicians is quite well known. Uh, creative disputes. Um, the estates of famous artists and, and uh, writers often talked about. Anyway, let's get into it. <clears throat> copyright uh, at its most basic um, prevents the copying of uh, artistic or written works 
um, paintings, books, films, music. Now, I think if I'm not mistaken, here we go. Here's a list of all of, all the different um, things a copyright uh, covers. Those things, technical reports, manuals, uh, painting sculptures, photographs, music of all kinds, songs, plays, dramatic works, films, videos, TV, radio broadcasts, even down to some technical um, areas, engineering, architecture in particular, copyright applies. In the commercial realm, promotional literature of advertising, uh, and even um, in IT, so computer software, and, and there's something called databases, database right. Um, as a form of copyright, that all applies uh, in, in, in those sectors as well. Um, uh, computer software, you might be wondering why. Uh, the reason is that software essentially is, is a string of text. Uh, it's coding, it's letters, numbers. So we kind of view that similar to letters on a page. So that's why there's a copyright precedent with that. Uh, although in some situations you may get a patent on software that's exceptional, I should add, it's more exceptional circumstances. But anyway, there you go. So the, the important principle about, about copyright is that, uh, of course, it's property. We know how successful certain copyright can be to licensing stuff. Um, and uh, the other thing about it, this is an automatic right. I mentioned it's non-registered. You don't have to register with the IPO, meaning as soon as you create your creation, as soon as you take your photo, as soon as you finish the last word on your, on your novel uh, or screenplay, as soon as you finish painting that picture, as soon as you finish writing that piece of software, it is yours. You own it. Uh, and uh, it's an automatically automatic right to your ownership. Now, the question then comes around how you defend that. Uh, that's a different question. Uh, and uh, that gets a little more challenging at times, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so it's free and instant, you don't have to file it, that's the good thing. Now there is a different uh, length of time of ownership on copyright. And this is might be interesting for you to, to, to discover. Um, the copyright lasts here in the UK, and there are variations in other countries, but for the UK, it lasts for 70 years um, after the, the, the creator's death, 70 years after. So that's why, you know, you, you might come across things around the estate of um, uh, uh, deceased um, writers, for example, I'm, I'm thinking of Tolkien at the moment, um, there's still, he, he, you know, it's still under 70 years since he died, therefore there's an estate that manages all of the Lord of the Rings um, work, uh, adaptations, etc. Likewise with Picasso, um, there is a, an estate, there's a company in, in, based in Paris uh, that manages all of his creations. There's a huge volume of material that he's created. They have rights over that and, and that's managed on behalf of his descendants. Um, so the 70 years um, is still you know, significant commercial interest for creators and, and their children uh, more often than not, and whoever, whoever owns, whoever the copyright is assigned to over time as well. So um, that was again the, the different example. So a, a big the obvious question, okay, Jeremy, so this sounds really easy. I create it, how do I defend it? So again, it's fairly straightforward um, on the surface. So as soon as you create something, you you may wish to do this. You don't have to, but it's advised that you you do. You you put C in a circle, your name and the year of creation. That's the sort of standard practice. Now, what that in effect is doing is um, you're you're simply stating um, this is my creation number one. This is my ownership of this creation number two. Uh, and you're also saying because it's copyright, I have all rights over the use of this creation. It's effectively your keep off the grass sign. Uh, and you're telling the, the rest of the world that they can't use what I've just created without my permission. That essentially, and when you when you put that C in a circle and your name or your company name and your year, that's all of that is what you're asserting when you put when you do that simple little thing that you're doing. So for example, on at the bottom of your web page, if you're if you're right, you're creating your your new business page, um, you want to put C in the, in the circle, your, your business name, do that. Uh, you're asserting your ownership over the content. Uh, now, how then do you prove 
that it really is yours if you get into a dispute. And I hope you don't, but if you do. So it all comes down to who got there first. And this is again where you need evidence that you created what you did when you did. And there are different ways you can do this, different techniques. Uh, some I would advise more than others. I mean, we have this deposit your work with the bank. I've, I've, I've never heard of this done by anybody, but it, I've heard secondhand people do this. Try your luck if your bank will accept it. Uh, certainly your solicitor, uh, particularly if it's an IP attorney, they, they will take your manuscript, for example, and they'll they'll archive it, they'll stamp it received, and, and there's your, your date proof right there. Now this other one, the third one here is, is quite well known, and you may have heard of this, more relevant if, you're, if it's something written, that you, you post um, your manuscript back to yourself, registered post uh, in a sealed envelope so that the envelope can't be um, messed around with in any way uh, and that way your your manuscript whatever it is 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 safely inside the envelope with of course the all-important post date on it so that's evidence of when you posted what you did and when you did so um to my knowledge that's never been tested in a court of law uh so in summary i think probably best to deposit your work with a third party that's recognized like a solicitor um, so that's basic way to you have to evidence you create what you did when you did um, an important principle there so with copyright another principle the creator owns the work uh, and this is something i want to, to talk about um, as a sort of a sidestep but very very relevant to, to the issue of copyright is that if you're a freelancer if any of you are out there are doing freelance work and you're creating material for people um, I hope you know that you own the intellectual property on that. So for example, if you're a photographer, you're taking pictures for people, you own those pictures. You own the IP behind that creation. Now let's flip it around. If you're, if you're contracting or commissioning someone to do work for you, they're a freelancer, um, you don't own <laughs> the IP. You may use it, but you don't own it. Um, and so that's where, um, for example, if I use a photographer to do a portrait for my website, the photographer will own that image. And I would need to, if I want to retain ownership of that, I need to have them to assign the intellectual property to me. So it's an assignment of IP needs to take place. Uh, and that can be written in a contract of engagement with them. Um, it could be written in a separate agreement, but that needs to be done in order for there to be a clear ownership of who owns the creative work. A lot of people get caught out on this, but but uh, important, very important. It's called an assignment of IP. That's the, the jargon we use. Uh, what if you're an employee? Um, how does that work? Well, it's, the situation is quite different. If you're an employee, full-time, part-time, the default position in law is that the employer owns the IP. Um, so that's, that's a different situation. Um, and if you're in a creative environment, that may well be in your stated explicitly in your contract anyway. Uh, but if not, the default position is the employer owns all IP that you create as an employee. So a different situation when it comes to direct employment as opposed to um, casual freelance. Um, so very important on, on, on rights there. Now, um, many people ask the obvious question, you know, what can I get away with, with other people's copyright and um, actually the answer to that is very little. Uh, you should best assume that, for example, any image that you you find on, on Google or whatever, you should best assume that's someone's copyright. They've taken an image, they own it. Now where there are exceptions and they are specific and I'll go, I'll go through them so that we, we know, um, you can use um, portions of say written material for non-commercial research or private study or quoting for critique or review. Um, if it's a recording, um, different form of copyright, making a copy for a visually impaired person, makes sense, reasonable. Personal recording for time shifting purposes, watching a program later, of course, that's a, fair enough to copy for those reasons. Um, basically, uh, everything else, assume that it's in copyright. Um, and uh, it's always best to seek permissions if you're going from the creator, if you're going to use their work. Uh, and it's, it's a question of, of property and ownership again. Um, if we flip it around and, you know, if I was a creator or you're a creator and you saw someone using your creations um, without seeking your permission, that doesn't feel good. And, and it's not, it doesn't 
it's not it's not a fair transaction there should at least be the right of attribution the permissions and um, if relevant and, and if required then um, a royalty a financial recognition um, of, of use um, and i think particularly in, in the creative sector um, i'm all for um, creatives if you like asserting their rights over their creations um, they should be able to manage their creation and and earn something from it um, just because things are free and easy on the internet it doesn't mean um, that it's okay to use and it's not okay so uh, that's my little my little spiel on copyright and i'm just um laying out the the um how copyright is used uh in in, in law today now um the world evolves but of course and we move on and a lot more material is online and things are able to be used easily that's why we have other forms of copyright being created i'm just going to touch on very briefly creative commons um you still are in a license agreement with the creator with the photographer in, in using that um although for a lot of creative commons work on on picture sites like pixabay for example you still need to attribute the photographer likewise we have things called open source software um where you can use but this again there's a condition to using it that you know some of the source code is, is available or all of it is available for for others to use so you've got conditions even around the stuff that seems seemingly free I um, mean, there's still a license relationship between the licensee and the licensor. Right, last five minutes. So I'm just going to wrap up with copyright before the final two, and, and they're quite quick to go through on trade secrets and know-how. On copyright, um, again, there's more to it than just simply what I've described. There are other things. Copyright protects others from copying, adapting, publishing, renting, performing, or broadcasting. There's a whole range of related rights to copyright. There are things called moral rights as well, um, the right not to be sort of defamed uh, as a create as, as your creation, not to be misused. Uh, we see that a lot, you know, with, with musicians saying, I don't want your my song used in your political rally. That happens a lot. They're asserting their moral rights. That's that's a part of the, the family of copyright. Um, and uh, so that's just so that you know. Uh, and likewise, you know, copyright can be bought and sold, transferred. Music songs can be transferred between owners. The Beatles have, have, have had their back catalogued, owned by different recording companies and artists um, over the years. Uh, it, it's something that's, that's yeah, it's property, as, we, as I've said, it can be bought, sold. And maybe that will be um, potentially useful for you as you create copyright works that you can, you can sell or license that work as well in whatever way. So see it as, a, as another potential revenue stream. Great, last three minutes. Um, I promise to finish on the hour and I will. And this is quite easy for me to go through. Know how and trade secrets, uh, the last two forms of IP. Very clear, very easy for me to explain. Let's go with trade secrets to begin with. Trade secrets are used more often than not in uh, industries where there's a, there's a secret technique or, or a recipe for that matter. They use a lot in the food and drink uh, sectors where there's that grandma's secret recipe for, for making that cake. I keep coming back to cakes, I don't know why, uh, but there's a secret recipe there. That's a trade secret, really simple to protect. You don't register it. You just have to keep it secret. Uh, you don't divulge that with anybody else. If there's someone in the business that you're working with or, or a partner, you sign an NDA so they don't divulge the trade secret as well. There's no expiry date on that. It can last forever. The recipe for Coke, dare I say, will be still a recipe for Coke and kept secret even in 100, 200 years time, I would expect. Um, very important there. So um, no expiry date, very simple. Just keep it secret, don't need to register trade secrets. And uh, know-how, um, that is the skills that you have in running your business that give you potentially a commercial advantage in your trading area uh, that you you wouldn't want to lose to someone else. And that could be something as simple as networks. Um, that could be something as simple as um, a mailing list that you that you that you own, that you have acquired rightfully um, under all the correct GDPR regulations. Of course, that, that's an asset that you have because it's a marketing list you can contact people with. Very, very useful um, piece of know-how. In fact, you could say that's a trade secret. Uh, no other know-how could be maybe there's um, SEO skills around getting your website higher ranked. Uh, maybe again, there are partnerships that you have in your business, or maybe you just know an industry really, really well. Um, that's your know-how. So think about what your know-how might be when you start your business um, and play to your strengths. That would be my, my bit of advice. So that's it. That's IP, the a beginner's guide 
all six, form, six forms of IP. See it as a menu. I hope some of these you can come back to and revisit uh, at another point. As I say, we run a lot more webinars on IP here at the Business and IP Center on the specific parts of the family. Um, do check out these sites. Contact us, bipc at bl.uk if you've got any further questions. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'll be happy to help where I can um, beyond today's session. Uh, and last, last word in the last minute, can I please encourage you to fill in that feedback form that you received today? Um, that's a massive help for us today. Um, we can get some, some feedback from you on how you found this session and, and the whole day. And important for us too, we, we, it helps us to secure uh, funding in the future as well. And that's all important in this day and age so that we can still be around to support people like you. So thanks again for attending um, today. Thank you for attending uh, in this breakout room. This is the last session uh, in, in this room today. Um, I wish I could see you all in person and to, and to greet you and thank you for coming in person. But I'll thank you virtually uh, and sign off and, and wish you the very best uh, in whatever endeavors, whatever enterprise you're going forward. Um, take care and my very best wishes. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.